All right, so here we are in chapter number 44. Just a brief recap from last week. If you remember, um, in chapter 43 is when they came back to buy more food and they brought Benjamin with them and they were all worried because the first time they left, all their money was given back to them and they didn't know why. They didn't want to make a look that they stole the, the corn. So they bring back all the money and they're, you know, they're asking the servant of the house, like, hey, look, when we came, you know, we paid the money and everything, but it was, it was in our sacks. And he set them at ease and said, no, no, it's fine. I had your money. You know, your God has given that to you. He's blessed you. And then um, they start to be a little bit more relieved. And then, of course, they sit down and they have lunch with Joseph. And Joseph's not angry with them. Simeon gets released unto them. And they have this nice lunch. That's where we left off. And, of course, Benjamin gets this, this huge amount of food, right? Like, he's really blessing Benjamin. He gets all this extra food. And that's how we ended off chapter 43. So now in chapter 44, they're getting ready to leave. So it starts off in the morning. They're, they're packing all their stuff up together and getting ready to leave. And what, what does he do? Well, he ends up giving them their money again. He puts all their money back in their pouches. But this time, Joseph devised a plan. Obviously, he cares for his brother Benjamin. Obviously, he loves him. And he wants Benjamin to still hang back and stay with him. So he cunningly devises this plan to make it look as if Benjamin stole from him. So that way, he can throw him in, you know, throw him in prison, so to speak. He's, he probably wouldn't throw him in prison. He'd probably just be hanging out with him and, and reveal himself unto him. I don't know. I mean, we don't know. That's not what happened. But um, obviously, he wants to spend more time with Benjamin, and he doesn't care. Like, yeah, his brothers can go back home. He doesn't care, you know, that they, uh, you know, after they had done everything that they had done to him. But he wants to keep Benjamin around, and he knows they need to go back to his father and stuff. So he's trying to do this. This is the plan that he makes. But let's start reading through. And uh, I know we read the whole chapter. We'll go, go through this kind of quick. There's a lot of duplication in this chapter, just like in the last one, where they go and they explain everything that had just happened. So we probably won't go through necessarily every single verse when, when we do the recap. But um, let's get started here. In verse number one, the Bible reads, And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry. And put every man's money in his sack's mouth. So he's really blessing them a lot. He said, give them as much as they can carry. I mean, he's loading them up, right? He's giving them all kinds of food. And you know what? Give them their money back. Verse number two, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest and his corn money. And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their asses. And when they were gone out of the city and not yet far off, Joseph said unto his steward, Up, follow after the men, and when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Is not this it in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth? Ye have done evil in so doing. So he lets them get away a little, just a little bit. And, you know, he's, he's acting out the whole place, the whole thing, as if he just discovers, Oh, they stole my, you know, they stole my silver cup. So he sends out his servants to go overtake them, stop them, and be like, what do you guys think you're doing? You know, I've been nothing but good to you. Why are you rewarding evil for good? You know, I've, I've given you your corn. You know, I, I fed you. You came into my house, and this is how you treat me, is basically what he's going to them with. Now, of course, uh, they don't know what he's talking about. And in verse 6, they start to explain themselves. It says, And he overtook them, and he spake unto them these same words. Verse 7, And they said unto him, Wherefore saith my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servants should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sacks' mouths, we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house, silver or gold? They're saying, What are you talking about? If we wanted to steal from you, why did we then bring all of this money back that we had, we had already got from the first time around? Obviously, we're not out to steal from you. We're just trying to make everything right. That's why we even brought our money back from the first time around. And they're, you know, and they're just kind of in, incredulous at the accusation, saying, what are you even talking about? And because of, the, of their astonishment at this and their assurance of their own innocence, that they know they didn't go in and steal any of this stuff. They make this statement. Now, we've seen this already in the past of people kind of making some foolish statements. And I preached on this, but we see it again and again and again. People will say things. And, and this ought to be a lesson. You know, it doesn't matter how confident you are. You ought not to, to make foolish promises or say foolish statements that can end up getting you in trouble. 
And let's see what they say here. It says uh, in verse 9, With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. So they say, you find that silver cup, whoever, whoever you find that with, let him be put to death, and then we'll all be <coughs> servants unto Pharaoh. That's how bold they were in their confidence of saying that you know, none of us has stolen this thing. Now, again, you can be confident without getting yourself, you know, without, without making these statements that then is just going to end up getting you into trouble. Because as much as you want to proclaim your innocence, obviously, what if something like this were to happen to you? Now you're stuck. Now you're saying, okay, well, now, we're, now I just said that Benjamin should be put to death because it was found with him. You know, instead of trying to make a good explanation, which obviously... You know, they didn't expect that to happen, but it still happened nonetheless. You know, Jephthah didn't expect his daughter to come out and greet him after he had made the promise to God that he was going to sacrifice the first thing that came out to greet him. He didn't expect that. You know, people don't expect the worst thing to happen. Otherwise, they wouldn't have said the things that they said. But it's because we don't know what's going to happen is why you need to keep tabs on your mouth. You need to keep track of the things that you say and don't say things foolishly or out of emotion in order to try to persuade someone or convince them. Don't say something that's just going to end up getting you in trouble. Let your yea be yea and your nay nay is what the Bible says. You know, for anything other than that cometh, you know, cometh of evil. It's, you know, bad things happen when you start swearing. The Bible says swear not at all. Neither by heaven nor by earth. You know, don't swear by anything. Your word should be good enough. You don't need to prove it by adding more unto your words of, of saying things like this. And, um, but they did that. And, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's a pattern that we've seen already with them making these types of uh, statements. So you know, they make that statement and then, uh, and then Joseph's servant responds in verse 10. He says, and he said, Now also let it be according unto your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant and ye shall be blameless. So he changes it a little bit. He's like, okay, you know, we'll be according to your words, except he's not going to put him to death, but he's going to be the servant, and then the rest of you will be blameless. He's like, look, I don't need all of you to be bond servants because one person did this. Because he already knows. I mean, he was, he was in on this. He already knows who it is. He knows that his master, Joseph, has something planned, and which is why he put it in there to begin with. So he knows that Joseph doesn't want him put to death. So after they say that, he's saying... No, you know, whoever it's with, they're going to be a bond servant and the rest of you are going to be free. Verse number 11 says, Then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground and opened every man his sack. So they're ready to prove this. They're saying, okay, fine. They get down with haste. They, they open up their sacks and they're like, you know, we don't have it. Verse number 12, And he searched and began at the eldest and left at the youngest and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they rent their clothes and laid it every man his ass and return to the city. You can only imagine what they must have been thinking at that time. They're just like, probably in shock and disbelief. You know, it says they rent their clothes. They're really upset that, that this actually happened. You'd be like, what? Like, no way. How did this happen? And it's one of those days where everything's going just great. They're getting sent home. They got all this food. They just had a nice lunch. Next thing you know, disaster happens. And that's, that's the way, you know, when you have really bad days, something really major impacts your life like that, you never forget those days. This is, this is something I'm sure had stayed in their memory for a really long time, even after everything had settled. You know, just that, that feeling when you, you know, it's like they see this cup in Benjamin's sack. So they're going to go back now and take care of it and try to settle this issue and, and figure out what's going on because they can't believe that this just happened to them. So they, they return back, all of them. They're not just like, okay, sorry, see you, Benjamin. You know, they, they go back to, to try to square things away. Verse 14, And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there. And they fell before him on the ground. So once again, they're, 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 they're getting on their knees in front of him, you know, and they're worshiping him. And Joseph said unto them, verse 15, What deed is this that ye have done? What ye not, that such a man as I can certainly divine? Now, what's kind of interesting here is you see that word divine. Normally in the Bible, the, the most common usage, and it's not used very often, but the word divine or a derivative of it is, um, it's like 
basically what he's saying, don't you know that I can you know, commu like communicate with God? Like that I can divine, that I can foretell things, that I can see things. You know, it's given to me of God. That's what he's saying here. But normally that word divine is used for people who use enchantments and people who are into witchcraft and people who are into that type of thing. That's normally like the diviners are, are bundled into that, you know, because there's these, the false prophets, people who are saying they get, you know, they know what God wants and they could tell you your, your fortune tellers and stuff. That's usually what a diviner is. So it's kind of interesting that Joseph is using this. I don't know if he's using it because he's in Egypt. And because he's his position of power and he's, and he's just using that word like he's got this communication with God. But what I think is really interesting is that whether knowingly or not doesn't matter. What Joseph is doing here is illustrating perfectly how most of these people that claim that they can divine actually operate. Because did Joseph need some type of, of you know, something from God to tell him that Benjamin had his silver cup? No, but that's like what he's claiming. Right? He's saying, don't you know that I can certainly divine? Joseph set up the whole thing. He doesn't need to divine. He already knew in advance because he's the one that planted it there. But what he's saying to them, he's kind of lifting himself up and intimidating them, saying, don't you know that someone like me can divine? And I'm sure he already has that reputation, right? Because he was able to do the interpretation of the dreams for the, the chief baker and the butler. And then he was also able to um, tell Pharaoh's dream, which is why they're in the predicament they're in right now, and that they even have that food saved up. So he's gained this level of respect and everything else as someone who's really wise, someone who's um, wisdom. And I'm sure a lot of people think there's something magical or mystical about Joseph. And he's looked at as someone that can divine and speak with the gods, which is what Egypt would think, right? Not instead of just the one true, holy, living God that gave Joseph the ability to um, interpret the dream back when he was, uh, he was doing that and giving God the credit. But here he's just, he's basically using this as an intimidation thing, right? He's really just laying into him. Don't you know that someone like me can divine? And um, obviously this is all part of his plan to, uh, to keep them, to keep Benjamin as, you know, there with him. But let's keep reading here. Verse 16, the Bible says, And Judah said, what shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. Now this is a pretty profound statement because I don't think he's referring to Benjamin stealing the cup. They know they didn't steal the cup. But what he's doing is he's saying God has found out our iniquity. What he's doing is he's taking, they're finally taking responsibility for what they had done to Joseph. And the reason why I believe that, if you look down, it says, God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants, for one plural. He didn't say of thy servants, as in referring to Benjamin, and, and just saying, well, I guess God found out Benjamin that he stole this. No, he's saying of thy servants, plural. God has found out our iniquity. And then he says, behold, we are that. He's looking to, to just face the music now. And you remember the last time they were there when they took Simeon captive, when he, when he put Simeon in prison, he put them all in prison for a few days and then he keeps Simeon bound. And they already were thinking then that it's because of what they did to Joseph. So the guilt is, is coming through strong with these people. The guilt is, is just is overwhelming and Judah's just, just kind of, time to face the music. All right, this is not a coincidence. You know, all of these things that are happening, you know, they're believers, they believe in the Lord, and they know that this stuff is not happening to them by chance. With everything, all of the events that have happened from them first coming into Egypt and being thought to be spies, and then them getting their money back when, they, you know, mysteriously all of a sudden they have their money, and then coming back and, you know, they're saying, no, you had your money, and, and everything that's happened now, and then Benjamin's got this silver cup. They don't know what to make of it. So Judah just is basically trying to come clean, not in what they did, but just, just with his own conscience, I think, and just saying, okay, God, you know, like, it's time, it's time to face the music. It's time to, to own up for what we've done. Apparently, we're being punished now for our sins of the past, for what we've done to Joseph. This is what he's owning up to. 
Now, with Judah here, it's real interesting because Judah, now we're going to read this, 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 the, the, the majority, or at least, I don't know, I don't think it's all the rest of the chapter, but it, most of the rest of the chapter now is just Judah talking to Joseph. And this is when things get to really start getting close to home for Joseph because he starts bringing up some of the events that happened to Joseph. And obviously, Joseph's there, you know, talking about Joseph's death. Joseph's alive. And so he's talking about the things that happened. Well, let's just, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let's just, let's just let's keep reading through this chapter a little bit. Verse number uh, 17, he said, God forbid that I should do so. So Joseph responds to Judah when he said, look, we're your servants. We've done wickedly. We're your servants. And Joseph responds. He says, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. So he's saying, no, 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 no. He's like, that's not right. You don't all need to be my servants. Just Benjamin does because he's the one who's, who stole the cup. You guys all just go home to your father, bring the food, you know, and go back. They're basically, I don't have a beef with you. I don't have a problem with you. That's, that's why he's playing this off because he only cares about having Benjamin with him anyways. Verse 18, now Judah's going to intercede because remember, Judah's also the one that made himself a surety for Benjamin. He's the one that promised uh, Jacob saying, look, send Benjamin with me and I'll make sure that he comes back to you. And he says, I am surety for him. And if anything were to happen to him, you know, the responsibility falls directly on me and I'll pay for it. So he's the one who's trying to take charge here of the situation and just and intercede for Benjamin because he's responsible. He's made himself responsible. Verse 18, then Judah came near unto him and said, oh, my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said, so he goes on this thing, saying, You know, we told you we had a dad and a, and a younger brother, and you told us to bring him down. And he goes through this whole explanation of what had already happened. He's telling Joseph this, though, because he doesn't know all the details of the conversation with the father, with Jacob, you know. And they said, you know, basically, we told him that he, Benjamin had to come with us, and he didn't want to send him, but then he told us to go get food again. And they're like, look, we're not going to get food unless you send Benjamin with us, which is what we've already read in the previous chapter. And um, we're going to skip ahead a little bit here. Look at verse number... Um, 27. So he's explaining now kind of a little bit more detail why it's so important that Benjamin be sent back home. This, I mean, this is ultimately what he's trying to do. He's, try, he's trying to gain Joseph's sympathy and say, look, this is really important to my dad that Benjamin come back with us. So he's trying to explain the whole thing. And this is hitting really close to home for Joseph because it's, his, you know, it, it's all his brethren and his dad. Verse number 27, And thy servant my father said unto us, Ye know that my wife bare me two sons. He's saying, You know that my, and he says, My wife. Right now, how many wives did, Joseph have, did Jacob have? He had four, right? But he's referring to Rachel as his wife because that was his favorite. And he's telling him, You know that my wife bare me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. So here Joseph is being, at least getting confirmed that his father thinks he's dead. Because he doesn't know what they went back and told his dad. He doesn't know. I mean, all he knows is that as far as he knows, no one came to look for him. You know, he doesn't know what happened to him. He just knows he was sold into slavery. He doesn't know that his brethren went down and they took his coat and they dipped it in blood and made it look as if an animal had killed him. He doesn't know any of that stuff. And now he's, he's understanding that that's what happened and that his father, his own father, thought that he was dead. And, you know, these events are starting to, to probably come back to him. And it means a lot to Joseph, obviously. Um, and we're going to see in a minute because it ends up getting to be too much. Joseph can no longer contain himself. And that's going to, uh, we'll see that next week in chapter 45. But I'm probably going to dip ahead a little bit just in the first couple uh, verses just to show you that because Judah goes on this whole, his whole speech here. He says um, in verse 29, And if ye take this also from me, and mischief befall him, ye shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. 
Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass that when he seeth that the lad is not with us, <clears throat> that he will die. And thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. So he's saying, look, he loves Benjamin so much that if, if, you don't, if you don't send him back with us, if we go back to our father, you don't understand, if we go back to him and he's not with us, our father's just going to die because his life is just wrapped up in the life of his son, Benjamin. He's already lost his other son, his brother, Benjamin's brother. He's already lost him and that was his favorite. And Joseph knows that he was the favorite. And now he's, you know, he's going to start to see this a little bit more from, from that point of view. Because up to this point, he's just thinking, okay, cool, I'm going to have Benjamin here and I'm going to hang out with my brother Benjamin. These guys can all go back and they go back to their dad. But this really, I think, just, just gets really close to home for him. And he starts to think of his dad because he was, his, he was the favorite, remember, and he was a good son and he did everything right. And... Um, it gets to the point, like I said earlier, we're going to get to that in just a minute where it just, it just overwhelms him. But I think this is also a big turning point in Judah's life. Now, you can look at Judah's life, and we've read a lot about the things that he's done in the past. And if you remember, there was a chapter in here where it's kind of like, the like the, there's a continuity of, of events that are going on. And then there's just this one chapter that deals with Judah's life. You know, it talks about him with, uh, with his friend and he goes off and, and he has these children and his children are real wicked, right? And God actually kills two of his sons, like, directly. Like, God directly causes their death because they were wicked, because he didn't like what they were doing. So Judah, and, and that was just this one chapter that's, that's just kind of in there and you're thinking, like, why is this even here? And I think there's a, very, there's a good reason for everything in the Bible, obviously. But we're, seeing, we're starting to get an insight into Judah. Now, what else is important about Judah? Well, Judah is the tribe that was chosen of who Jesus Christ was going to descend from. Right? Now, Reuben was the firstborn. So normally, like the birthright and the passage travels through the firstborn in, you know, in a lineage, and especially when there's, there's a king or someone really important to be born later. But Reuben lost that birthright because of what he did with his father's wife, with, his, with the concubine, how he had taken her and laid with her, and that was extreme sin. So, she, so he completely lost that birthright. Now, but what's interesting with Judah is you say, well, Judah wasn't that great of a guy. And you see the stuff they did. You know, he raised these, these wicked children that were put to death. And, and then he, he ended up thinking he was, he was laying with a harlot. And it turned out to be his daughter-in-law because he wasn't giving his other son to her to be wife that, as he, was, he promised he was going to do. And that as was right for him to do, that she was being a widow and she was waiting for, for him to get older, for him to take her to be his wife. And you know, all this stuff about Judah they'd done in the past. Well, now we see a very good redeeming quality in Judah. And honestly, I think... I personally believe this, and it, you know, it's, it, it's, I'm not, can't be dogmatic about it in the sense of just saying this is absolutely the reason, but I think this is the reason why Judah was chosen as the tribe that Jesus Christ himself was going to come forth from. Because what we see with Judah here is he's offering up himself now to take the blame for Benjamin. In, in order for Benjamin to go free. So he, in a way, is kind of acting out like a savior type of a role. And he's saying, you know what? Let all the punishment fall down on my head and let him go free. And I'm going to take the blame for all of this. And that's what we see uh, Judah doing here. Um, he's willing to sacrifice himself you know, for his dad's favorite child instead of resenting the favorite. Remember, in the past, he resented the favorite. All of them did. They resented Joseph. They, they didn't like the fact that he was dad's favorite. They didn't like the fact that he was daddy's boy. And they resented him and they sold him. And Judah was the one that, that actually sold him into slavery. It was his idea. Judah's the one that, that said, hey, what's it going to profit us if we kill him? Let's sell him and get some money for it. That was his idea. 
Judah's idea was the one to send him in to, sla to, to sell him into slavery. So now we see he's come a long way because he, he, he's done all that wickedness in his past, but now he's willing, instead of being resentful, because Benjamin's a new favorite, right? After Joseph's gone, Benjamin's his favorite. And it's known by all of them. And he's even telling them, you know, if Benjamin doesn't come back, you're going to bring my, my gray head to the grave in sorrow. So Judah's willing to sacrifice himself and, um, and, just, and, and perform this great, uh, this great deed. Look at verse 32. Excuse me. Bible reads, For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. So he's saying, look, this is what I did. I, I became a surety. I am responsible for Benjamin. Verse 33, Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. So he's offering up himself to sacrifice, you know, to sacrifice himself and just say, you know, take me as a bondman. I'll be your servant. I'll be your slave. Throw me in prison, whatever you want to do with me, but let him go free. Because I cannot go back and face my father. I can't see him, you know, bring, going down to the grave in sadness because now his other son is gone. And at this point, there's just too much emotion for Joseph to handle. We're going to go a couple verses into chapter 45. There's a lot more to preach next week. But this chapter is kind of light on everything that happens because there's a lot of repeat in the story. Um, so we're going to, it's a shorter sermon tonight. But um, at this point, Joseph can't handle it. Look at verse number 1 of chapter 45. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. So it got, it just, he just got overwhelmed. It's too much. You know, it almost had happened in the past when he brought him in for lunch. And he saw Benjamin. Remember, he had to go and, and weep somewhere because he was, just get, he was just full of a lot of emotion. And at this point now, especially with Judah, I think, it, it meant a lot to him seeing Judah now doing this and, and, and being a lot more righteous since Judah was the one that was responsible for him going into slavery. And, and everything that's going on, he, he just gets to the point, he's like, I can't carry this on anymore. I can't play this charade. I can't, I can't you know, be this person and, and continue this. I have to let him know who I am. And he, and he calls and he just, you know, he's like... Get everyone out for me. You know, all of his servants. Get everybody out, except for his brethren, so that he can make himself known. So he, he lets them know that he's Joseph, and he, and he weeps out loud. And he, he weeps so much that, like, you know, the people he sent out, all of his servants, they can hear him, you know, because they're, they're, they're probably sitting by the door, going, what's going on? You know, like, like, like what's he doing now? And they hear him weeping. And, of course, he makes himself known. And we're going to get into all the rest of this next week. But, um... It's a pretty intense chapter. You know, you read it and try to put yourself in, this, in, in the situation. Don't. You try to put yourself in the situation of Joseph, you know, having been estranged from his family for so long, going through all the hardship and then rising to his position of power and then his brothers coming, you know, and him having all this power and authority over him um, and his dreams, that, his visions that had come true and them doing obeisance to him and everything else and now seeing the lives of his brothers, how... They actually do care for each other more than when they so wanted to kill him and throw him into prison and sell him into slavery. And um, so, yeah, it's real interesting to see how Judah's life had turned around. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for this great story. We thank you for um, learning how, you know, even though people may have done a lot of wrong in their past and have, and have made a lot of mistakes and have maybe even hurt us, that so often it's not too late. It's not too late for people to change. Help us to take encouragement in this story, dear Lord, that maybe we've made some really bad mistakes. And, you know, that mistake that Judah made, he made some really bad mistakes in his life. He's made some really poor choices, choices that have impacted people negatively, very negatively, in fact, with, especially with Joseph selling him into slavery. 
It's almost unthinkable how, how mean and hateful that can be. But that his, his heart softened later on, dear Lord, and that he got right. And um, I pray that you would please help us to have forgiving hearts, to be able to, to turn the other cheek when people do us wrong, to be able to not hold grudges against people who have done us wrong, especially people who have done us wrong in the past, dear Lord, that, um, that we give them multiple chances and, and, and forgive them and, and you know, just pray that they'll, they'll change and, and start to do what's right. Sometimes people don't do what's right until much later in their lives, dear Lord. We pray that you would please just um, work in our lives, help us to be forgiving, and that you would um, help us understand, you know, it's, it's usually not too late to, to turn back to God and to start doing what's right. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.